try to get started here. Um, thanks, thanks to everyone for coming out on such a inclement evening. Um, no, there's nothing. Yeah, black flies. There are none of those in here, so that's good. I'm Craig Lyon. Um, I'm the moderator for the school district for the Cal School District, and I've been asked to help moderate this forum. Um, it's not town meeting. I'm not going to entertain any motions. Uh, I might rule someone out of order. <laughs> Paul. Be careful. No, you're the last person that would rule out. Um, so I just want to give you a brief overview of what the evening is about. It's, it's information. It's sharing. It's really, from the school board's perspective, I think I can say it's about listening. Um, you know, they, I, we have... I think an idea of where Callis seems to want to head, um, but nothing is said and done. And so this is part of the process to deal with that which has been, I'll say editorially, handed down from on high. Um, so um, I'm going to turn things over in a moment to Dot Naylor, newly uh, uh, enthroned school board member. And then she to Scott, and then we really want to hear from everyone who wants to speak. But at that point of the evening, I'll kind of moderate it, and I will ask people to be recognized to speak, to not just jump in, um, and, and to please state your name, because the secretary taking the minutes wants to know who people are, and, and it might be helpful for you to do that each time you do speak. I'm going to tend to want to give everyone a chance to speak at least once before I come back to someone. So if you've got a point you want to make or a question, jot it down or remember it, and then uh, I'll come back to you. Does that sound reasonable? Any questions? Any, any thoughts or expectations from anybody? Okay. Wow. Well, this is easy. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Dot Naylor. Good evening. Um, thanks for coming, and as Craig said, at least you're away from the black flies. Um, I must apologize. Chantel would normally be here. I misinterpreted the email from her saying that she had to go to... Um, uh, uh, school board chair and super, uh, superintendent training today, and I guess I kind of thought that was just day and not also evening. <clears throat> so I apologize, she is not here. Uh, Scott is going to speak to her. Tremendous amount of time she spent um, on the Act 46 committee and not just at, at a meeting every other week, but all the study and figuring out everything in between times. She spent an enormous amount of time, and um, I'm sorry that she could not be here. <clears throat> and that said, Scott will kind of fill in for Chantel a little bit, because he was at those meetings with her and has talked to her about um, what he would like to do. And he has a very short... Um, PowerPoint. Probably not <laughs> short enough. <laughs> yeah. There's, with some very interesting things <clears throat> on it. And then we basically want to answer your questions and hope that you will talk amongst yourselves about the important part of our school and what its future will be. We know its past was <coughs> our town actually decided in 68 that we needed to bring our students all into one building from the three buildings that we were using. And then we decided when we needed to make it bigger. And we had a couple fights along the way, but got all settled. And we did not need the state to tell us what to do and when to do it. And so I will hope that we will still be able to tell ourselves what to do and how to do it. And our school will remain in our town in the future. Scott? Thank you, Dad. And I echo thanks to, to all of you for coming. And um, just want to point out that Susanna Culver, um, the vice chair of the school board, is here, um, as is Katie Reed. 
Susanna, um, when I was on the school board, was always sort of the policewoman of the no bullshit zone. So um, I'm trusting you to, to keep it up, Susanna. Um, in addition, I'd just like to welcome friends from, from East Montpelier and, and Worcester. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, I think they've welcomed me and, and Dodd and others of us to, to their forums. And um, I would encourage you if you're... Oh, and Drew. And Drew my just, God, Drew. Yes, the, okay, wait, Drew, school board member as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, uh, Worcester in particular uh, did a great job, Matthew de Groot. I'm going to try to rise to his level of statesmanship um, because, in fact, I have to declare my, my colors in this matter. Um, I've been, at times, I suppose, a bit of a bomb thrower on the side of not consolidating, of pursuing a, a federated structure that preserves the town districts. But um, I owe it, first of all, to, uh, to Chantal Eckhaus, who, in spite of our disagreeing completely about this um, respect, uh, she asked me to become, to step into her place as voting member of the Callis delegation on this Act 46 <coughs> study committee um, when she stepped down. Um, but even more, I owe it to you to try to, you know, paint uh, a really fair and objective picture of the choices that, that we face. They're pretty significant. And I think as Dot um, mentioned in her flyer, I, you know, I may think I, I know the answer, but really, I don't. This is, this is something that we all have to get to together, and we all have to listen to each other um, and listen to each other again with respect and with understanding to, um, to do the best we can and arrive at the best outcome we can. So <clears throat> I'm, as I mentioned, on the side of developing an alternative. Um, Chantel uh, is in favor of consolidation. She's not alone. This is a completely respectable point of view. There are examples of consolidated systems. We even have you know, a unified union district, which is what that's all about, down the road in Montpelier that functions quite well. Um, it's entirely possible that this might be uh, a good thing for our five towns to develop this. And it's worth thinking about, you know, why does it work there? Why might it work here? Or why might it not work here? Just to, again, to, to ask the questions and, and probe into, uh, into what it's all about. So, um, I have, uh, I've tried to modify this presentation I first put together during the, um, sort of the more bare-knuckle days of the, um, of the Merger Study Committee about six months ago. Um, but I tried to reframe it again to give you a sense of what it is that we picked up during the course of our 18 months of work, um, but doing so in terms of questions, um, just questions to, to prompt you know, further questions, I hope. And so while we do this, I, um, I'd love it if you were to interrupt me at any point. You have something that you're saying, what the heck is that? Or what do you mean by that? Or, um, wait a minute, I, there's something that you should know, or whatever, or something everybody else should know. Please, don't hesitate. This, this is really supposed to be just a, a provocation to get you to talk. Because I'm already tired of it. <laughs> I have a question already. When yeah. did the idea, what year did the idea of consolidation actually get mooted for the first time? For the, well, that's a, um, it's been sort of heading in that direction for many years now. But um, Act 46, and perhaps that's my cue, um, <coughs> to uh, Act 46 in 2015 was when it kind of uh, sprang from
from full grown from the uh, and fully armored from the heads of the legislature. Twenty fourteen, there was discussion about it, yeah. but they didn't take any action. Uh, education committee studied it, took testimony, but didn't end up doing anything late in the session of twenty fourteen. I think. Mm -hmm. And it came out, it was, you know, this consolidation was, has happened in other states much, much earlier. You know, so Is that your question? When did the legislature do this? Our legislature, yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's quite a history. There's a lot of background, which we'll try to speed through. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Sorry. Sorry, we are. This is sort of suburban. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, um, if anybody is wondering, we're feeling bad about not knowing what Act 46 is, you shouldn't, because it's not exactly a thing that tells you what it is by its name. Um, uh, kind of like these, you have to be introduced before you know. Um, so, um, and even when you... Um, thank you. No, thank you. Even when you see what it is, it's it's not um, it's not immediately obvious that it's such a uh, a major thing. An act relating to making amendments to education funding, education spending, and education governance. I love the modesty of it. It's um, but one of the interesting things. This is the first page of 64 pages. Um, about a third of it is governance. A third of it is taxes. And a third of it is kitchen sink miscellany. But um, you can see that the very number one concern is the drop in student numbers in Vermont by about 25% from 1997 to 2015. And then, the very next one, the number of school-related personnel has not decreased in proportion to this. So you can tell where, immediately where the legislature is coming from. So. Um, <coughs> What's the real, what's the nub of it, the action that we're supposed to take? Essentially, the, um, the legislation gives three options. There, uh, Section 5B is what they call the preferred structure, which is the one board, one budget, one education tax rate for all, um, for all five towns, since we're focusing on the supervisory union. Um, Section 5C, right after, talks about an alternative to that, which is, in fact, basically the system that we have now, a supervisory union with member districts. So the existing system becomes the alternative in the legislation. And then um, something that I perhaps misread at one time, but a governance structure different from the preferred structure um, Is it a real possibility or just a tease? The jury is still out. But um, there, there's movement in the legislature, even now. So we'll know a little bit more about that. Jump in, whenever you have questions. Um, next, please. So just a very brief um, account of where we are. We, we formed um, in the fall of 2015 a merger study committee under this 16 BSA 706B, which was looking at um, the possibility of a merger. Um, it basically deadlocked in March, just a couple of months ago, uh, between these two options, a consolidated structure with you know, town councils to sort of soften the, um, the loss of town boards. And then this federated structure that keeps town boards that I mentioned I was in favor of. One of what, what would a town council, <coughs> what would they do? Would they have any voting authority? Um, they would have potentially uh, be involved in hiring of teachers. They would, they would perhaps have a kind of advisory capacity, but they would not have um, <laughs> voting authority. No. They would have no legal authority. So it's, it's like our select board in the town has legal authority to make decisions for our town and change mm -hmm. our rules. And the, the school board is the legal authority in our town that's elected 
and can make legal decisions. Yeah. So our school board in that would be a consolidated board of the five t members from the five towns and we would have maybe two representatives. And those two representatives would then be uh, part of the advisory council. But it might be akin to, someone brought up an example in one of our meetings, it might be, correct me if I'm wrong, but it might be akin to, you know, our select board has a lot of groups that meet to help with the work. So we have a cemetery commission and a conservation group and all these groups to help organize things in our town. They have no legal authority, but they give you suggestions, and the select board is likely to follow their recommendations given the work they've done. So it would be sort of like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that <coughs> would also be true over building issues, things that would happen here at the school. They would have advisory. No actual, no, no actual authority. Mm -hmm. Or the yes. ground, either. Or the ground, yeah. Mm -hmm. The school ceases to belong to the town at all. It transfers for a dollar to the consolidated union. It no longer <coughs> belongs to the town of Calais. If that board decides to sell the schools, no recourse. This town can't. That gets sold, that's it, and closed and sold. Except for the property belongs to the town. Property, I don't know if the, I don't know if the school the deed, is the not the asset. The deed says the property belongs to the well, town. Okay, the, but I mean the school closure, yeah. I think the school asset goes to mm -hmm. the group, correct? Yep. Then, yeah. oh, sorry, Sage. Who is uh, the select board in <coughs> the A consolidated structure with town councils in this we're, scenario? We're the, the big school board? The Who sort of makes the, those legal decisions in the A? In A, there's um, there's a central, there's a single board that would be in the sort of the structure like that was the central supervisory union board. It, well, it, it's um, it wouldn't be exactly that. It would be a new thing. It would be a <laughs> unified. Who would those people at that board to make those legal voting decisions? I, I beg your pardon. Who? who would appoint those people oh, on this board? We would elect them. We would elect, for example, the kind of thing that we were looking at would have had East Montpelier, maybe elect three, Berlin three, right. Callis two, Middlesex two, and Worcester one. Right. Okay. That's so um, based on population. Right. Based on population, okay. exactly. Right. Just wanted to know if there was actually a town representation. In yes. We would elect our representatives um, to that single board. And the single board also owns the budget. So we would no longer have a separate Callis Town budget, East Montpelier, uh, not town, sorry, but school. There would be a Callis School District budget and East Montpelier School District. It would be one budget for all six schools, the five elementaries and U32, it would be one budget that was decided together. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. That idea of a unified budget, to me, um, is counter to what Act 46 is supposed to accomplish because under a unified budget there is absolutely no incentive for any one town to keep its budget under control because we don't vote by town, we vote on the whole shebang and who's to know if Callis sort of added this and added that. There, every school only has an incentive to add to their budget and not to keep it under control under what you have described. And that, to me, is a huge concern. Yeah. Um, uh, I, if I were to, um, you know, put on my statesman hat, um, I might answer that the the board would be, you know, rigorously trying to <laughs> keep tax yeah. rates, hold tax rates down, and would be um, looking carefully to make sure that that something like that didn't happen. But um, but there are, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. We've all done budgets. Right. Yeah. One of my big concerns with <coughs> all this is, too, that, I mean, because of the population-based representation, essentially you've got a couple of towns controlling the decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if it's to their financial advantage, which it will be because of the debt, the shared debt, uh, you, you know, they, would, they might not hesitate to close a school like Hallis, which has you know, because they can handle the capacity at their school, which for them is a very good thing. It strengthens their local economy. A town like Callis, it hurts. It hurts our ability to draw families. It hurts property values. I mean, this goes way beyond education. 
That's yeah, real these consideration. Are, yeah, these are exactly the sorts of things to be to be weighing and to be thinking about. Kelly. Uh, so I'm Kelly McMartin. I teach kindergarten at Calis, so I'm representing actually from a teacher point of view right now. And I just think, boy, I don't know. I just can't stop thinking about how we had this hour and a half long meeting today where we talked about every single kid in the school to make sure we had a plan for them to move on for next year. That was so tight and so good for them. Mm -hmm. And it's the most creative um, place I've ever known for meeting student needs. Just amazing. I taught here for eight years, moved away to Wisconsin where they consolidate like crazy. 800 elementary school students in one school. They didn't care. It was all about money. And then I came back because this is really awesome. This education here specifically is so good. And I think what happens when all of the um, decision making goes away and something happens with the student, we really need support from our school board to make those legal decisions about how we can meet needs specifically. I just really worry about that. Like, do we still have the same ability to meet student needs if we don't have our strong school board who we can go right to backing us up and saying, look, we need to meet this student need. What are we going to do? Um, what if we don't have that? Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't. That really yeah. is scary yeah. from the teacher point of view. Like, yeah. We right. love to have that support so we can stay creative and awesome for our students. And did, did you not have that in Wisconsin? You want to talk about that? <laughs> no, no, maybe not. <laughs> want to go off the <laughs> Do you know their situation there? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Well, I, I do, actually. <laughs> Um, okay, then that, you not as well know. as you, of course. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Um, thank this you. is very unique yeah. and very special what we have going on, and um, I would hate for this recipe to um, not exist the way that it mm. does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, there's one. There's one aspect of the process that is highly regrettable, which is that there was never a vote. The committee never laid an egg for the, or, or you know, oh, came up with that. all right. Wrong image. <laughs> We're glad um, you didn't lay an egg. <laughs> <laughs> the committee never came out with a, with a decision that voters could actually vote on. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, uh, that is really too bad. Um, uh, Chantal has pointed this out, uh, Matthew has pointed this out, and they're right. That was, um, that was unfortunate. Why, um, and I was a part of it, so. Why, in your opinion, should? Should there have been? Mm. Well, because then, then it allows people to, you know, to actually focus on the issue. Um, people always, I mean, at least I, I shouldn't generalize from my own experience, but, you know, when you have to make a decision, that's when you find out about things. Um, and it would, it would have, I think, maybe motivated broader involvement and um, discussion. Mm -hmm. I also do it, you know, I was participating in most of those meetings as just a public member from the beginning of that. In fact, Scott and I have been involved with this since this was in the legislature. And I would actively say at multiple meetings you need to be having public local concerns meetings. That's basic Vermont policy. For, that's how I worked in policy and planning and transportation. That's, this is protocol that you follow. And if you go out right from the beginning, you don't need to know all the answers. You go out and talk to the community, you get their feelings, you bring them back, and you, that's how you develop your process together. And it did not happen. They ignored that. So no, 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 we're going to wait and wait and wait. And ultimately what happens is, I think the hope is that people will go into a blind vote not knowing what they're voting on. Mm -hmm. And then in the hope that you can actually pass it. And that is was the, this is such a large decision. <clears throat> Maine did this, I know I'm probably tired of hearing this, but Maine did this in 2008. And it's been a pretty big disaster for many of those communities, about half of them. I called many of these communities personally. I took notes on them. And you know, they said basically the cost went through the roof, accountability went to zero, and public participation just dissipated. The schools no, no longer had that ownership. They no longer had that franchise. And many of them, I mean, they practically had a revolt. They had to change their legislation to give the towns, make it voluntary 
And since that time, since the last time I looked, what, 42% of the towns that were forced to consolidate are either in the process of or have withdrawn from consolidation, mainly mm -hmm. rural towns. It yeah. works in the Chittenden counties of the world. So, so yeah, so so we're we're well in the, the experience of others <laughs> is, a, is another factor to take into account to the extent that you can find out about it, whether it's Wisconsin or Maine or yeah. um, anything that you know about. Although I should, again, the alternate to that is that <clears throat> some people have, you know, grown up or or even taught in consolidated systems, and um, they're very, they've had a very successful experience. So it's not like consolidation bad, no consolidate good. It's a, uh, it's sort of a case by case thing that you have to look at. I, I think. What's well, the one size but, fits um, all that really messes it? Scott, a little, yeah. a little factoid is that there are 89 towns in Vermont who have not merged or had a vote, or they're in various stages of trying to decide what to do. When you read in the newspaper how Act 46 is successful because 105 towns have now merged, and that includes towns like Montpelier, who was already merged, and South Burlington and so forth. But there are 89 towns who are doing things like this, trying to figure out what their people want to do and how they can get there. And, and interestingly, it's about 40% of the students in the state, kind of like what Rick was saying about the problems in Maine, you know, Maine the relative ratio. Uh, I'm sorry. But I'm not sure when to jump in with this, but there's a particular jump. issue that, gets, that has gotten me interested, which is the debt. And oh, it, the way it's been explained to me is yes. that, that Callis has basically is debt-free, has a, you know abundant space, yeah. the physical plant. We would be merging with um, East Montpelier, I believe. Yes, it has um, quite a large debt, yeah. yes. and that we I would then be on the hook for that debt. And I've got to ask, what, what, what on <laughs> earth would would persuade us? You know, if there were a vote, what on earth would persuade us to take on debt that is an ours? Yeah. Well, what's, um, the I think what's the penalty to us to say no? I mean, is there a reason? <coughs> in, is, 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 is there some sort of What's the penalty there, to us to say no? There, um, I will be getting into, <clears throat> I'll be going into debt very soon. <laughs> <laughs> when you do, the yeah. question's been worded another way, which is, yeah. what, what's the penalty to us to say no? To say no to So given to that we would obviously say no to taking on debt, why would we pers be persuaded to say yeah. yes? To or say in other words, what would be the penalty what are we if we risking? said no? Yeah. What are we risking? Yeah. yeah. Um, the possibility of being forced to do it anyway. Um, is but but we'll, we can get into that as well. But I got, before you go, I, I know you really no, want to it's it's okay. Okay. <laughs> No, I but, want to hear. Uh, this is going back a little ways. The representation of the voting elements from different towns and how yeah. that was partitioned out. It's my understanding that due to constitutional constraints, the ratios of number of voting members to population base, those those numbers can't really be changed. Like for example, if we all want if if it was agreed miraculously to have the same number of voting from representatives town. from every town. Yeah. That could that not even legally be done? It it could be done. I think um uh, Matthew was working on some of this. Uh, if you had fractional voting, um uh, for example, uh, if you had three vote, three members from Worcester, each of whom had one third of a vote. Um, so you have voices in the room, but you don't have more voting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. More voice, less. Yeah, that's voting. not really. It sounds before. like yeah. Chittenden County is running the whole state, and we're going to do the same, get the same thing done. Well, um, well there's been quite a fear. But, uh, I, I, I want to try to discourage just jumping in. I know there are lots of questions and answers. But I do want to let Scott get through his thing to some extent, and, and this is great discussion. <laughs> I'm not trying to quash it, yeah. but to move through it, and, and there will be time. Um, if it's a burning point right then and you're going to lose it, fine, but I just yeah. want to... Well, I would like, I do want, this is a point that's relevant to what you just said. <clears throat> and I think, you know, this, throughout this process, there's been this carrot and stick approach, and 
You know, it's we're going to do it. If you, you better listen or you better do it or we're going to, there's going to be penalties. I think the question we should be asking is, you know, what are going to be the penalties for our elected officials if they force this crap on us? Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. We toss them out. I mean, this is kind of misrepresentation, in my opinion. I'm fairly harsh on this. I, I, I will have nice things to say about our legislators very soon. Um, but this, um, this is an important reference point. Uh, the, the Act 46 goals, anything we do has to satisfy these, these five goals. The, the legislative language is, you know, there's all sorts of stuff encrusted around it, but it boils down to these five. Um, and the, I, I once thought that these were about as bland and milk toasty goals as you could possibly have. Applehood, uh, applehood, and mother yeah. pie. <laughs> Man, like, that's going to be a long night. <laughs> um, the <laughs> it's like a rock group. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the the more I, I've sort of thought about them, um, the more they actually reflect a certain <coughs> way of conceiving education um, that. Maybe you like, maybe you want to think about some more. But if we, if we continue, please, just to, so equity, quality, efficiency, transparency, and value. Um, and this, uh, this is a quote from a meeting that of the, uh, I guess, of interested people uh, that Nicole Mace and Donna Rosa Savage, who's, who works at the Agency of Education. Nicole Mace is the executive director of of the Vermont School Boards Association. Um, they were at U32, and <clears throat> Nicole said, the preferred structure presumptively meets the goals of Act 46. So that's why everybody, you know, the preferred structure is on a fast track to approval. Um, and that, that statement is echoed in um, so many official mm -hmm. documents. Does it meet it? Well. Yes, uh, by definition. By definition. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Yeah. Actually, it does um, many of the Well, we, um, it may. That's the thing. It may. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Are those five criteria defined? Has the legislature defined what they mean by? Uh, they, there, there's more, uh, there's more information than, than just that. Yes. So, um, quality, for example, is to meet or exceed the state's educational quality standards. Um, and uh, equity is basically um, equity of educational opportunity for all students in Vermont, mm -hmm. um, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, but for me, that, that's all hard to remember, so I kind of have to just get the, the core word. Um, but efficiency is basically efficiency. Uh, transparency and accountability, um, and you know, value. Value to the taxpayers. Value to the taxpayers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, financial value. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, oh, thanks, Rick. Yeah. Um, the this is what this is what we kind of crashed into. This idea that um, the reality of our situation appears to contradict that presumption, at least for our situation. Not necessarily for anybody else's. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but for Callis, it seems to. And um, and I'll explain in more detail. Um, so this is a question. This is the deck question. Um, and this is what ideally one would like the debt distribution to look like. This is actually how it does look like at U32, which has 12 million in debt, um, and like. <laughs> I guess most of the finer things in life, it all comes down to pizza. So um, <laughs> the shaded areas are the slice you get to eat. And the sort of underneath it is the slice that you pay for. Ideally, what you eat and what you pay for are the same. Oh, sorry, Sage. I'm yeah. wondering if there are actually percentages to build those pizza slices. Um, not, not, I mean, it, uh, basically one quarter, a little bit more than a quarter maybe, um, a little bit less than a quarter, 
Worcester about one tenth, and Calais about one sixth. So Middlesex, East Montpelier, and Berlin are almost the same size. At no, this not point? not really. Um, uh, Berlin and East Montpelier are, are, are pretty are close. Are they about equal now? Okay. Yeah, um, Calais and Worcester together are about equal to East Montpelier, and Middlesex. Right. Yeah, Middlesex is 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 in between, in right. between Calais and. All right, sorry. No, 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 that's okay. And, and it changes from year to year, which is why I, you know, didn't want to get too... The, the 12 million in debt, that's Berlin's three. No, oh, that's no, this is 32. That's only U32. That's right, the U32. So, but this pizza, this is a New York style pizza. It's, um, if you could tilt it on its side and see the time dimension, this is going to get paid off in 2019 and 2021. The, um, the next... The next slide shows a Chicago-style pizza. Um, so this is the elementary school distribution. Um, so the, if you were to tilt it, you would see Ishmael Pelier's debt. This is what, how it was at the time that we kind of discovered, we tripped over this issue, um, and how it was until December, roughly, of last year, before Berlin got its new bond. So um, if we were to tilt this on its side, East Montpelier would go to 2033, Middlesex to 2035, and, and this one of Berlin is almost paid off. But you can see um, East Montpelier has a slice, you know, roughly twice as much than what it's paying for um, in, a, in a pooled scenario, a consolidated scenario. And Middlesex has, you know, somewhat more. Um, Callis is eating nothing. Worcester, nothing. Um, the the what problem. A great deal. Pardon me. Yeah. What a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was this was the this was really the issue. Um, plus, in terms of per capita income, um, the uh, the highest per capita income town among our five is Middlesex, followed by East Montpelier followed by Callis, Berlin, and Worcester. So essentially, in this scenario, the lower-income towns were subsidizing, would, would have been subsidizing the higher-income towns. And because the achievement gap that has been identified as you know, our number one educational challenge um, is essentially defined between lower-income and higher-income populations, basically, this would be putting further pressure on lower income populations while benefiting higher income populations. Sage. Do you have a pie chart of, I know this was quite a few years ago when they were following the caps and um, how schools were doing. Um, Middlesex and Callis were the only two of the six in our supervisory union to not be on probation at the one of that those last years oh, where they followed it. Oh, those child left behind thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, when the middle school, or when, when we talk about equity, and I was at a couple of those meetings for Act 46. Bless you, Sage. It was <laughs> truly awe-inspiring. I do want to thank Berlin <laughs> That's one word for, for stepping up, and Carl oh. for coming and saying, you know what, this isn't going to work. Um, but also, <clears throat> You know, my son, who's in seventh grade, and the chair's daughter, who's in seventh grade, enter U32 with different learning abilities, different achievements, different everything. And when we were talking about equity, the, the big concern was making sure that all kids got what they needed. <coughs> I feel like this is already a school district for 45 years. Our towns have shared millions of dollars in a budget, as well as if you tack on that supervisory union money that we all pull in, I feel like our money is more than 50% shared, and why can't we be a district in a different way? Because we, we could work better, I know that, with the five schools having that ability, yes, having more organization maybe to help them work together, but it feels like we're making it harder than we need it to be. Um, and that those achievements, you know, Callis and Middlesex, they're in the middle. They're not really the small school, and they aren't really the big schools. 
and I, I don't think bigger is necessarily better. I do think sharing our our knowledge, you know, sharing our great teachers. We've got such a great staff here, and people have worked hard to get a great staff here, and the staff has survived so many principals. Leland, in sixth grade, <coughs> Cat was his fourth principal. So, and we fought hard to get that principal who will stay. The supervisory union's choice, which was one person on a nine people <coughs> hiring committee, didn't want to put our principal forward at all for even an interview, and didn't, and then forced us to have another person with her to meet people. And that person went on to be a vice principal for one year at U32 and then left. Like, we don't need <coughs> that higher up, more far removed from our town. People stay in Calus. Yeah. People stay in Calus. There's a you know, high population of kids who have grandparents in this town and whose parents went to this school. <coughs> and I don't know. And like, U32, bless them. But they bought new bleachers this year that don't fit the 7th and 8th graders in that gym. And they're like, for pep rallies, Simon, who's in 11th grade, said, who are the most spirited kids? Who want to embrace their school and like be part of the bigger school? And they bought bleachers that don't fit a third of their school in for pep rallies. It's like, really? So it's those upper, they're little things, but when you get more far removed from the local, and really, our school board, I don't think, earns any money. It's not, bless their hearts, but it's not a lot of money. Yeah. Um, I just, I'm sorry, I went on yeah. a tangent. No, but, but, but um, I think, uh, you know, this, this idea of distance and how important is that um, uh, is, a, is another factor to, to keep in mind. Um, so may we proceed? Can, wait, can I just ask something yeah. for this one? <clears throat> the Berlin chunk? Yes. Does that reflect the current? Time? No, so you will see yeah. that in the next okay. one. <laughs> the, um, the next one, I hope, is not too confusing. Um, <laughs> just say the numbers. <laughs> just, just, just point the, the numbers, numbers out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Point um, to the town and say the number. The important thing to, this is with Berlin's new bond. Mm -hmm. The important thing to, to see here is that with the new bond, which is the black pizza rim, um, <laughs> Berlin and Middlesex come very close to balancing out, to breaking even um, <coughs> in that scenario. The money that they put in is equal to the money that they, that they are getting, or that they have gotten out. East Montpelier is still disproportionately, uh, is still carrying a disproportionately large debt load. And Worcester and Callis, which have, you know, traditionally pursued policies, no bond policies um, for capital planning and budgeting and, re and replacement um, would essentially take on this segment. So um, again, it, it's the thing about this is, from my perspective, the debt issue, it's important because it's money, but it's sort of a technical issue. Um, and what's remarkable is how difficult it has been to solve. Um, you know, if, if we all borrowed up to our share of 23 million, um, you know, which would mean Callis borrowing almost four million dollars, for what? Um, we don't need it. Um, Worcester, um, 2.3, uh, and then Berlin and Middlesex would also have to increase their borrowing. Then it would be, we would, we would have a fair pizza. Um, but it would be a lot bigger. But it would be a much expensive bigger pizza. and more expensive well, pizza. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I don't, I don't so. sense any disagreement in this room with what Aunt Randy was saying. Not no, one no, 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 little no. bit. And, and, and fact, with what Sage was saying. I have a hunch that we are all <laughs> pretty much on the same page and here. I, I think, I mean, to, unless you can show that, that um, East Montpelier had some exceptional emergency that they had to fulfill, that if they just screwed up, I mean, do they have a facility that's overly grandiose? Yes. I mean, what? Yes. It's <laughs> kind of big now. They like it. Because they thought yeah. we were going to take us on. 
No, they don't. No, really. No, no. 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 That's not fair. A little bit that's not fair. fair. That's, that's not fair. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's not fair. We're, we're not. Um, we're not here to bash poor Ismael Pilar. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'll take it back. <laughs> sorry, folks. Kidding. Uh, I just wanted to say that, as Scott pointed out, it is a technical problem. So what we've all been trying to figure out is, is this a problem that we can make rules around? You know, so could, if we decided to consolidate, form one board, form one budget, is there a way that we could write in rules that say, but we're not paying for the debt? And you yeah, do why not? So, well, we've run into problems yeah. and we've, we've consulted with some lawyers and it's, a, it's actually a pretty complicated technical problem because that board in the current <coughs> legislation, state legislation, that board owns all the debt as one board. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can we move the debt to the towns? Or can we write in rules that, as you said, you know, towns are proportionally paying out of our one budget, you know, so we might be able to write something in, but we're just looking at the legal implications. Is that possible? And right now, Jana Ansel um, has been really working for us on this in the legislature, and it's not in the education bills that have been going through. It's actually gone into the housing, right? Uh, it's in it's in a totally different bill. No, no, it's not five thirteen. It's in a different. This is the tax one. I mean, the yeah. debt one. Is it's a, now in like tax legislation. It's still right. in the legislature. It hasn't been passed. She's not sure if it's going to go through, and I don't even know what it is that she's proposing exactly. Yeah, and and I think it's very important to make clear that the um, that people who are um, who see the educational advantages of consolidation are not in favor of of pooling the debt. They want a solution to the debt. Yeah, like Chantel. Um, like yeah. Chantel, for yeah. example. Um, I, there, uh, this sort of poolingness is is not acceptable to anyone. Yes, um, am I correct that each of our towns would be happy to continue as they currently do, each owning its own debt? Yes. Um, so we all are. <laughs> in other words, every single member is willing to have the current system continue. The law is, won't is, allow for it. Well, that that's the that's the issue. Each person who now has debt, each person town town who or town school district that now has debt is willing and and perfectly you know feels it's a moral obligation as well as you know just um, just a legal obligation to carry their own debt. The problem is if we merge, then what do you do with new debt? Yeah. What it, like if if all of a sudden we want to borrow a bunch of money, um, then do we then get to spread it around on Absolutely. everybody else? <laughs> no, 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 because we will all have a vote in that decision-making right. process. Uh -huh. No, but Where we not did not have vote. a vote prior. Okay. Yeah, but the town, the bigger towns have more votes. Mm -hmm. This is true. That is, is true. Problem. So, so, so that is that, that is, is a problem because yeah, we don't problem. ever need to have a bond here in Gallus if we continue to operate the way we have always operated, or at least for twenty years. We don't ever need to go that route of having a bond. So we would be in the position in the future of paying for other people's bonds when we don't have a need ourselves. Yeah, and you're assuming. We're no longer controlling the fiscal well, repair, the maintenance on these buildings. Do We're you not, see our town uh, people right. being yes. absolutely <laughs> willing to give up ownership of this no. building? I don't see that. Be crazy yes, to. Greg. The only way this will ever work is every town in U32 has one vote, not based on population, mm -hmm. not based on dollars and cents. Is the only way you could get a fair system going here, and then figure out the debt. But if you've got a three, three, two, one, it's never going to fly. Um, and the one, 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 one yep. um, won't fly either because of the constant, the way the Constitution has been interpreted by the Supreme Court. What about the fractions? Is that still a possibility to the fractional even, votes? The fractional. That that's a possibility. There there are a bunch of possibilities, including at large voting, mm -hmm. so that um, basically. Callus would still get, um, well, everybody would represent, you could do it just 
we're no longer, there's no difference between towns, period. There's just, we're just one great big thing. Um, and uh, vote, for, vote for the board out of that, or you can, ha uh, yeah, at large. at large, or you can have um, a way for candidates from each town to be voted on not only by the voters of that town, but by all the voters. Hmm. So, um, Denise. So, so what if one town said, uh-uh, sorry, we're not, help, we're, not, we're not paying our share. What are they going to do? Are they going to throw us in jail? <laughs> if, uh, if one town... Yeah, say, Callis, if this, if this were to come to fruition, and we get stuck with them saying, okay, you guys got to cough up some more money, and we said, sorry, we can't, we don't have it, what are they going to do? And it's not an idle question because we would be such fat little piggies mm -hmm. with no debt. Right. We'd look scrumptious. <laughs> <laughs> I love how this is all relating to food. <laughs> <laughs> Are you bringing pizza later? <laughs> I should have. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, what are they going to do? I would have given everybody the callous slice. <laughs> Fewer calories. <laughs> yeah. Fat free. Um, I, I, you know, basically what would happen is that um, everybody pays the same tax rate. Everything, um, and, and I'll actually be showing you in a moment what that looks like. Okay. If, um, Scott, it's the time. Oh, I know, I know. We it's are. terrible. It's okay, we're going to... Um, so anyway, we can, this, this is what kind of got my attention um, on the debt. The, the problem was, you know, it looked as though we were heading to more towards inequity than equity. So may we continue, please? Um, right, and this, this was, is basically history. Um, what we tried to do to fix it, um, and Janet played a big role in this, but um, last year it failed, and the message was no state-level solutions to local problems. This year, it's totally different, 100 180 degrees different. Um, there are a whole bunch of state-level solutions to local problems, whether it's to Vernon, wanting to get out of its supervisory union, or for you know, different situations with these various um, two by two by one mergers and, and different configurations of these. So I can continue. Yeah, so our legislators are, are um, I have to say, I mentioned I was gonna say something nice about our legislators. And with this H513, which is um, basically passed but hasn't been um, signed into law yet, uh, they, got, they really cracked it open much wider so there's a lot more breathing room for, um, for working on this issue. Um, anyway, quality. Uh, this goes to you know, a bit of what you were talking about, Kelly. Um, historically, the consolidation of school districts and the consolidation of schools has gone hand in hand. And um, the next slide, I think, shows that, um, ah, Right. Um, this is uh, this just shows you the, you know, the how difficult it is to draw a sharp line. Um, that yes, consolidation or no, because um, what the research will show is often that there is some small benefit. Usually, it's 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 not huge, but but it's measurable nonetheless to larger districts. However, the problem is that larger schools um, have, larger problems. have larger problems. Yeah, exactly. And uh, have a negative, no, Jamie, <laughs> you need to hear it. <laughs> and, um, and that they tend to work against student achievement. What was that quote from? I, did, I could see. Oh, oh, it was from, um, yeah, uh, Barry and West, um, Christopher Barry and Martin West. It's a 2010 um, article. It's one of the very few that actually looks at student <coughs> outcomes. Um, Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. And this, you know, um, a lot of times we hear that, you know, consolidation is, is um, sort of 21st century, you know, modern governance. 
Um, it's actually, it was formulated about 100 years ago and had its um, during, but, but that's not necessarily, a, I'm, not, I'm not dissing that actually. Um, the, its heyday was really between about 1930 and 1970, um, during which, you know, the great majority of school districts were consolidated. Now, the thing about this is, um, the um, consolidation arose as, for really good reasons, um, from the administrative progressive movement, um, essentially to try, because <coughs> there, were, there were lots of messes out there that needed to be fixed. And this is basically the heyday of the, you know, um, of administrative, centralized, big government initiatives. The, the New Deal, um, you know, the, the Sputnik, the reaction to Sputnik, um, Great Society, and it, it essentially, it doesn't come to a crashing halt. It continues to this day. There's slightly more, well, maybe 14,500, somewhere between 14 and 15,000 school districts left. But um, here is where the, the reaction began, you know, during um, the 1970s and the Reagan years, um, the reaction against the administrative state. Um, so this is part of a very big picture that's worth, you know, bearing in mind. Um, the consolidation accomplished, um, in many cases, at that time, a lot of good things. It helped to end desegregation. It helped Thank to um, improve. Uh, uh, help. Help <laughs> 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 to end segregation. Thank you. To end segregation, it helped to. Um, Really, to provide a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities to students who might not have had them at that time. The question is, you know, is that still the case? Um, and so, um, you know, when we look, we ask, what's what might really be going on? Um, there, this is from a um, a classic paper in 1987 that. Um, the expansion of the state's role into the local education arena <coughs> leads to larger and more bureaucratic district structures. This sort of goes to Sage's point from a while back. Um, larger, more bureaucratic, more distant uh, from the people. Um, and this is also closely related to state <coughs> involvement in education finance. So um, this is a point that, that you made, Matthew, some time ago about um, you know, the state, um, it's sort of a, an echo effect of Act 60 and 68. Um, <coughs> more involvement in finance brings more attempted involvement in the structure of governance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, anyway, efficiency, again, efficiency is great. Everybody wants to be efficient, I guess. Um, but, you know, everything in, in um, do proportion at the same time. And this, um, this is just to flag the efficiency can be problematic. Um, this was a book, Raymond Callahan's book, from the early 60s. Um, but it's amazing how much of it <coughs> resonates today. Um, the, the basic problem being the shift of attention towards the large-scale management and administration of schools and away from the actual educational experience for, um, for the child, the, the child's contact with the world in the company of his or her peers and, and teachers, skilled teachers. Um, so uh, this is, again, a question. How far do we want to go in that direction? Um, Oh yeah, um, the top. transparency and accountability. Um, this is, I think, in my opinion, fortunately, this is very unusual. Our supervisory union is usually really good about producing um, uh, honest and, and uh, comprehensible data. This is their worst effort ever, I think. Um, the idea of a cumulative tax rate over five years 
um, is, uh, you know, it, like saying, uh, every day I drive down Route 12 at 40 miles per hour. Um, where I, I drove down <coughs> Route 12 at 40 miles per hour for five days. So my five-day cumulative speed was 200 miles per hour. So um, it's just not, it just... If it doesn't you know, make sense, it just... Yeah. Uh, but this is, one, this is one of the risks of, you know, having of, of numbers. Numbers, unfortunately, can be used um, offensively as well as informatively. Um, so let's, let's get past this. I, I don't want you to remember this slide. It's, it's okay, this one. Um, this is the, the question of what happens to tax rates. Um, <coughs> the tax effects, Green Line is under a consolidated scenario. Uh, East Montpelier and Calais. Red Line is basically staying the same, supervisory union. Now, the thing is, this green line and this green line are basically the same green line. We would be paying the same education tax rate. The difference is the, where we start from. So that's the, that's the, the real problem. And this, here the issue is that this includes the tax incentives. Even with the tax incentives, we would be paying more from the very, from the very outset. So, um, and they sense that very quickly. Too. Yeah, after four years um, now. So, anyway, this is uh, the question is. Um, quick, Suzanne, you don't have any data that shows what that looks like after the incentives disappear. Mm -hmm. no. no, they stop in the last year. Nice. Mm -hmm. This true. is assuming um, we're sharing that, though. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. basically, yeah, does. you know what I've seen. In the in the supervisory in the consolidated unit, it's it's saved on average. The costs drop from maybe 0.5 to about 1.5 percent in the first years. Now then, without that collective, you know, that fiscal discipline that the individual boards really impose, that's where it goes out of control. Well, that's what the mainers said. It said, you know, talk to me. He said quickly. Cost skyrocketed because basically there was no accountability after that. This is what Charlotte was talking about. That's, yeah, and that uh, <coughs> I mean that in, you know, and the debt issue adds more. I think the numbers, just rough numbers. I think to say the impact on Calus for a two hundred thousand dollar property, I think it's <coughs> roughly about between was it three and four hundred dollars a year. Uh, I, I'm sorry, was, uh, that was from six months ago. There was a rough calculation. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty significant. We actually turned that into dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it was Watch. several hundred dollars. Yeah. Which meant that that didn't include but, Berlin. And yeah, right. That's, so just, that's, that's the difference that's the in old, between right. Cal mm -hmm. South and Calus. That was yeah. right. No, it wouldn't have included the Berlin. <laughs> so maybe I think you need to explain the graph, because I don't think I'm people sorry. can read it. So oh, talk so sorry. about what, what we're, make it clear for us what we're seeing. Sure. Um, this is the dollar, the, the tax rate um, per grand list value. Um, and the shows the and, and at the bottom the x-axis is the fiscal year going out. So this is where we were f uh, last year. No, year before last. This is where we are this year. And that's East Montpelier. It, and East Montpelier, sorry, where they are. Um, next year, the year after, the year after, the year after. If we were to stay in the same configuration we are now. That's the red line. Um, the blue line is if we had gone for the accelerated merger. If we had basically wrapped this up and, vo and decided on consolidation and voted for it and done everything. Um, with the discount. And we the missed short, that. With and the it's short no short short yeah, short. we missed that deadline. So this is that really train kind has of passed. Yeah. It's left the station. And it's also um, very, it's almost a bogus point, because you're not, it's a false savings. It doesn't yeah. know it's gone. Yeah, it's gone anyway. And this is, the, this is for the conventional um, merger incentives. Uh, so the green line. And at Calus... So, are you, so you're saying that under consolidation, Montpelier's tax rate is going to go way down. Yes. So East Montpelier. East Montpelier. Yeah. 
their tax rate is going to go down that much. Right. Okay. And ours. And um, ours is not. Ours doesn't go down at all. It ours goes up. Goes up. <coughs> yeah. And how so, much does ours go up? Um, well, it, um, it, it basically, this is the thing. It approaches 190 in um, $1.90 in FY2223. And again, that number does not include Berlin. Uh, does it does include U32? Uh, yeah, it does include yeah. U32. But it doesn't include, but it the, doesn't debt include the Berlin's new. The 3 million. The 3 million, million. The new 3 million of Berlin. So it would be hard. Sorry, right? yeah? So if, um, <coughs> if these are debts that are going to eventually be paid off, whether it's Berlin or East Montpelier or whatever, why not delay talk about merger until everybody's at a level playing field, i.e. debt-free? Because it'll be 30 years from um, now. Never yet. Yeah, yeah, um, 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I love it. That's a great idea. <laughs> Write that up and submit it. I like that. I'm <laughs> just aware that we've got 20 minutes. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> okay. And well, I mean, does anybody know when, me, when East Montpelier's debt will be Berlin just took 2033. 2033. Yes. Oh, and Middlesex so. in 2035. There are a lot wow. of people. Berlin <laughs> in 2037. We have yet a yeah, yeah, chance to speak. We'll promise that we will. <laughs> then. I just want to hear. I appreciate that. Yeah. Just a little time check. I, I'll just say just really quickly that the, 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 the precept of the whole graph being created is that, it, I mean, it really has to do with the debt. So you wouldn't really be able, it's very difficult to know, assuming the debt were to be resolved, what that's going to look like. <laughs> yeah. It looks like the so red line. That's kind of like the, 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 the what is elephant. It would look yeah. like the red line. Yeah, it actually, it ought to look like the red line mm -hmm. if the debt issue is resolved. But we're also um, making assumptions about how that board would vote on a budget. And, mm -hmm. It's right, true. What? Yeah, um, and yeah, a lot of imponderables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Craig has told me that we're the time is a wasting. Hopefully not well wasting time. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, I, I think it's it's good to be skeptical about all of this, not just consolidation, but about not consolidating. I think it's really important to look at all of this with a um, oh, this is from um, the National Education Policy Center. Consolidation of schools and districts, what the research says and what it means. And, um, you know, state-level consolidation proposals may serve a PR purpose in times of crisis. They're unlikely to be a reliable way to obtain substantive fiscal or educational improvements. So, um, really, again, it's an, this, this paper is an argument for case-by-case approach. So um, this is just a general idea of what a good governance structure should look like. Centralize what well, works best when it's centralized. I think <coughs> there was some discussion about that um, up here. Um, decentralize what is best decentralized. Um, however, in each case, there may be differences of opinion about what is best centralized or best decentralized. And to the extent that we can, build in new value <coughs> into the system. Um, continue. So this is, um, uh, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> um, this was an idea, this was something that Worcester showed that I thought was really interesting. Um, this comes from our merger study committee. Um, this is uh, the, the single board preferred structure model. And this is the current system, as portrayed by, you know, essentially a, a more pro-single board view. The thing is, this is actually even simpler than it looks, because the five towns are really, in essence, transformed into a single virtual town, with each town basically being an election precinct for that big virtual town. Um, what this, unfortunately, this, um, this doesn't show the most important bit, in my view, which is a kind of Copernican revolution um, of sorts. 
this here, each board, in the current system, each board revolves around its school. Um, here, the board revolves around the superintendent and central office. And, um, and that may be good, it may be bad. I'm not going to say anything about, about that. I think it's, but it has to be, I think, evaluated in that way. Um, can you just go back to that for a second? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just, I'm getting a really strong sense of people's <coughs> concern about debt, for sure. We're hearing that loud and clear. And some concern, too, about having representation on a larger board. Um, but I'm just curious with this slide, you know, when I look at this, I'm a little bit OCD, and I, the one on the left is like, oh, please, that's so much more appealing. But when I actually think about the education of our children, I think maybe I want the one on the right, you know? Maybe I want it to actually be way more complicated in some sense to do what's right for each individual child. Maybe I don't want it to be one big board that's deciding what's right for 900 individual kids. Maybe I actually want there to be a lot more people involved in that decision making and a lot more eyes on it and a lot more people close to the ground. So I just wonder what people think about that. Well, Katie, I, I agree. And I was thinking too, we're hearing a lot about the debt. And um, I'm wondering, you'd mentioned educational benefits, advantages, and you've talked a little bit about research that looked at larger districts, but what is the district saying the advantages are? Um, what are the educational benefits for uh, our school? Basically, it involves being able to mobilize and transfer resources more efficiently to where they're needed, um, ability to uh, provide a more um, consistent and uh, harmonious, perhaps uniform, uh, curriculum and approach to instruction. Um, possibly the ability to create um, experimental units such as magnet schools or maybe zero to pre-K type uh, establishments. Um, that's, those are the kinds of, of things that I've heard. And, and um, Matthew or Katie, is there anything else that I... Is there more research that we can find? There is an absolute, states? Yeah. unbelievable <coughs> time. Is it just massive population stuff? Um, <coughs> Where have you found benefits, academic? Oh, um, no, actually, you know, uh, there, there are actually yeah, relatively few see. studies on consolidation and student outcomes. Um, most of them have to do with uh, economies of scale and, you know, where are you, you know, money. Um, right. Efficiency. Efficiency, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, I do have a few that I can share. Yeah, it would be great if the district <coughs> could put it out, too, for the public to look at. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, Scott? It, it seems that everything you've been saying tonight um, really leads to the conclusion that each worst-case scenario could be made good by keeping governance at the place most directly affected. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You've Susan, done a good presentation. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm accustomed <coughs> to you, Susanna. You are the CALIS representative on the U32 board. I am. And I hear um, a lot of concern that a population of 900 students um, would not be well served uh, on an individual basis and perhaps might be overlooked um, by a, uh, a consolidated board, which is what we have at U32 right now. Right. Yeah. Um, do you see students being overlooked and not taken care of right now? I'm not aware of that happening. Um, at U32? Well, at, at, at U32. At U32. Um, with I'm with not a full board. Uh, except for, you know, what you would expect to be a background, you know, flux of cases that where things don't work. Because, sure. you know, there's always something that doesn't work. But I think in general, um, the, the U32 governing structure 
basically works. It could be better. Um, Do you see the size being a, it, a hindrance? Do you no, see no. people just being indifferent to the concerns and needs of the, the board members or not? I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're indifferent or you know, unconcerned. Yes. Thank you. There's a vestige in this though, that you have to remember that you've still got well-established local boards driving the elementaries, and believe me, that carries through to that school. You start breaking. Send him there with marching. You crank that up. <laughs> We're also talking about comparing <coughs> kids from three years old to twelve year olds. Mm -hmm. To twelve to nineteen year olds, mm -hmm. and I think there's a huge developmental mm -hmm. need to be yeah. ignored with that question. True. Mm -hmm. That's it? I've always been really pro U32 because long ago my kids graduated from there and I've lived either in Middlesex or now in Callis. And I think a school like U32, which I've, I've really known this school over a long period of time, you get your good economies of scale when you've got 900 students. Mm -hmm. I have grandchildren who will go to, probably go to Montpelier High School, who knows what will consolidate in the next few years. But you hear about Montpelier High School having a student, student population of 200 and losing some of their best courses. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. if you, you want to talk economy of scale and you want to do it, now that's not a good comparison because Montpelier is 9 through 12, U32 is 7 through 12. Mm -hmm. But U32 has got a lot of good things that a smaller school sort of doesn't have, can't have. Yeah, and, and there's, um, that's one of the points that the Secretary of Education uses to argue in favor of trying to pool the resources as much as possible in, in larger districts. Um, in the hope, in the hope, I think it's a hope, it's not necessarily a, a, a sure thing, that this will allow for um, greater opportunities for, for students. So um, again, I, I guess we're almost done with this. Charlotte. I, I want to jump ahead a little. Um, I think that we have over time among our school uh, centralized and consolidated many functions that have worked very successfully. And you had some of those on your chart mm -hmm. there, things that did work, yes. buses, who, you yeah. know. Right. But also some academic things. Uh, many of us remember when we didn't, when we didn't even have a single curriculum within this school. You know, so having a single curriculum is really a strength, and sending our kids to U32, having had the same curriculum, is a huge strength, I think. Yes. So I think we all really have done many things that are consolidated and that have helped all of us, mm -hmm. and, and have strengthened us. What I hear you say, though, is that you are part of a group that in considering a confederated mo a federated model federated confederated <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, you are trying to those other things that are just much more naughty you're trying to figure out what would work best for all our mm -hmm. schools yeah. and I would say um, that that's our only solution not to do what the state tells us but to figure out what would work well for us and whatever we call it, we call it whatever would make Montpelier happy. But I would just say thank you so much for all you have done in trying to consider what would work for us. And please continue. That's where I am. Please continue to find things that would work for us that do bring us together, but in ways that we could all of us accept and and endorse. I mean, I think we want to endorse some kind of coming together, but we certainly don't want to endorse one that makes our kids not have that personal touch or that puts us at a at a tax disadvantage that is so severe that it would, you know, really cause hardship to people. So the only solutions I see is for your group to continue its work. And it's horrible, terrible, hard work. But thank you, and please continue, because what else do we have? Thanks. Um, I think everybody is working really hard. And um, 
that's the one thing that makes me feel optimistic about all of this. There's so much uh, energy and talent and especially goodwill mm -hmm. going into this. And even though there were difficult moments during the study committee process, and what I've actually been doing is taking you on a fast forward of 18 months of our study committee. Um, and this is sort of the where the alternative group, it's an example of, of what an alternative um, a federated schematic might look like. Because we do think that we can do better than what we have now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's another uh, point that we share in common. We all think that we can do better than we're doing now. Um, and this is essentially sort of along the lines of what Susanna was talking about. This is sort of like the preferred structure, the, the consolidated structure turned inside out, where instead of the center governing the localities, the localities govern the center. Ah, the Copernican. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> In That's the it. waning days of the legislature, has anything new come out of the yes. Board of Education? Oh, that, yeah. Can you tell us what those things are? Well, oh, they're, they're so long. Um, well, there, there's a lot that of will stuff. directly affect. But basically, um, Katie, do you want to? I was just going to say, one of the things in the new HS 513 that's pretty much been passed, it does mention specifically that in unequal levels of debt would be <coughs> one reason why the state might consider an alternative structure. So basically, it gives us a, a reason to say to the state, we don't fit the preferred model. It might, it might give us a way to say that and have them agree and say, yes, you are one of the exceptional cases. Because a lot of the towns, Scott spoke of the number of towns, or Dot mentioned the number of towns that haven't come to an agreement that are looking at an alternative. And many of them, it's because of geographic isolation. We don't have that excuse. We're all, we're pretty close together. We all managed to get to U32, <coughs> but we do have this debt issue that could be one way we say to the state, this is and why we need a different structure. That and that's in the new legislation. It hasn't been passed yet, though. No, that right? has, yeah. Um, well, Janet has emailed this morning no, that's say something that she would be leaving, they might be leaving something That's out. That's a different the, the, piece. The one that's and H509 is part of that whole debt package that's being... But the one I'm talking about is problem. in the... Yes, the, the, new re the reason to be an alternative. reason to be alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Not yeah. how to Thank deal you. with the debt, but so the reason to be is there, a, okay. is there a need to race to put together a document that um, is specific and outlines exactly what is preferred? Well, that's another thing that okay. came in this Act 513, that right now, if you want it to be a preferred model or one of these SS-1 or the side-by-sides, you have until November 30th to agree to what you want and write articles of agreement, and there's a few other things you have to show how you're going to meet the goals and so forth and so on. If you're going to do an alternative model, which this is and we've been talking about, you have until so many months after they they go through there's a what is it the CLAR the passing rules whatever that final okay. thing is for passing okay. rules okay. and right. then it, or January 30th whichever comes first so it looks like we have two or three more months to get together <coughs> with the other towns and whatever towns write the articles go through the hoops and show that we have um, community support for what we're doing that's why we're having these meetings that's one of the things you have to show is how the community is responding to this and, and so those are some new things that have happened this year I mean it's just a miracle that it's happened but it's a lot of people went to a lot of hearings and, and state and board of education hearings and wrote comments about their rules and how they should be 83 pages could actually become 27 pages um, and there's a lot of work and, and Dodd sat in on Senate Education Committee meetings all through the spring I don't know <coughs> not more. all through the spring a lot of them a lot of them <laughs> the spring it was <laughs> fun nobody knew who I was it just really my <laughs> whole <laughs> so anyway um, we can go to the next one
this is just an example of there are a lot of big issues still that <coughs> need to be worked out regardless from the legal issues which are which are huge yeah. um, and which uh, are not easy um, making sure that there's clarity of responsibility in whatever we put together um, in lines of authority protecting the disadvantaged objections have been raised to the idea of um, having voters vote on the central office budget in that the central office budget is sort of the the bucket of things everybody hates and that everybody can easily feel like they can vote no against whereas a lot of that is special education things for, for people who, who really need it, students who really need it. So my answer to that objection is that what people hate about the central office budget is not what's in it so much as that it's diffused into everybody else's budget and they don't get to vote on it directly. Or even I know. know. We're, we're, exactly. Yeah, no, sometimes. Even know. But that in fact it's, it's highly, and, and, and Defending it and justifying it is, you know, part of the discipline of budgeting, and I think it is defensible and is justifiable. Um, much of it, perhaps not all of it, but that's, you know, why you go through that um, those hoops. Um, so, I forty six penalties against small schools. This is especially Worcester, which would lose its small school grants. Um, that would not having Worcester again the lowest per capita income town <coughs> bear the brunt of of any formation that we make is unfair and we need to deal with it without you know in a in a mutual way. Um, and electing board members. Oh there's one more here that I think is dear to Rick's heart. Um, voting smart, making sure that people are involved. Um, I would have been so happy to see Doug, Lily or um, Geraldine coming yeah. here. Um, Geraldine yeah. did talk to me. She called did me. She? Yeah. 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 She's very interesting. But there's a whole segment of town that is that just feels alienated from this, I, I have the feeling. And <clears throat> really want them to be able to be part of it and feel that they're an important part of it. Sorry, yes. Would there be a, a special town meeting petition for adopting this new structure? Um, yeah. After it goes, uh, gets okay by the Department of Education. By the, uh, by the Board of Education, yeah. yeah. Uh, by, yeah, <coughs> the agency yeah, and then the board, to. state board. Yeah. Then we would have to vote on it. That's sort of the, the sequence of events. It would be Australian? Or Australian, yeah. yeah, which is, you know, that's, <laughs> that's why that public, that ongoing so public yeah. feedback is really important in this process, because you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there, that's been, and people just don't, they don't really know the ramifications of this, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Could I have um, people? Yeah, um, there's one more slide which um, shows Raphael's hand. <laughs> um, just, uh, just um, the, the basic idea is that um, for an alternative, it should be, it's a living thing. What we're dealing with here is a, is a living human thing. Um, education and the governance of education. And um, the hope that we can come up with something that relates to it in that same way. Um, I, I apologize if I've turned on too much, but. That was a really short slideshow. <laughs> it's a lot of information, and I think the discussion's been good. I just want to offer the chance to anyone who didn't speak during that or offer their thoughts to do so, if you want to. If there's somebody that's saying, well, I'm maybe less out there than Rick. Or you still haven't answered the question. Which What's is, the penalties to Callis if we don't go along with this whole oh. action? That was the very first question that came out of the thing. What is the penalties to us as a town if we don't go along with the masses? I was really hoping you'd forget that. Actually, the potential penalty is that in the legislation, in Act 46, 
it gives the state the authority to do what it wants with us, essentially, to have its way with us, uh, <coughs> to consolidate us against our will, if you want to put it that way. So, um, it is. But the way it looks right now, it looks like we have a fair chance at asking for an alternative yeah. and saying we don't want to go along with this. The other and big this question, is why, though, to put out the reasons. Right, yeah. and part of that is if we want to go that route, we do need to know that that's what our town wants and that people have said that. But also we need to know what our other neighboring towns want, and um, it would be much more effective if all five of our towns can come together and put something together that's mm -hmm. a right. joint effort that says this is how we're moving forward as a supervisory union, as a group. And totally agree. Yeah. So Absolutely. I thought you didn't think you already voted. Yeah, no, not one, exactly. Well, no. yeah, they are. Um, in favor of consolidation? Right. The, the board. Just their board. board. Just the board, not the town. Right, right. Um, right. But I don't know how they're going to consolidate with towns that don't want to consolidate. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's the part of the legislature behind yeah. them. That, that's why we're supposed to have yeah. conversations with yeah. even these five. Look, if you just think about the four towns getting together, we can invite, say, East Montpelier, we'd like to invite you, but we also would be required. Part of it, I think, is that, Scott, that we talk to Montpelier, Penfield, exactly. Barry, yeah. that we talk to other towns. So we don't just kind of stay to to ourselves, we need to kind of expand and see how many people we can get into our spider's net. But exactly. in the end, we will probably end up. Did you say spider's net? <laughs> <laughs> Web. Web. <laughs> but um, you know, in the end, I really think it'll end up our five towns doing something. Don't you? I I think so, and I agree. Um, reaching out beyond. Just a supervisory union is very important too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there are there are more possibilities than than we've even thought of yet, um, and it's just a matter of talking to other people and finding the common ground and the, the common needs, the common concerns. We can maybe do even better than we think we can do. But we do have. We thought we had November as our deadline. Perhaps we have until January. Right. We had, what, a year and a half? And we got nothing done. No offense to the mid, to the meetings, but we're we're at square one. Well, I wouldn't we say, know that. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say, say that. nothing got done. No, I would we, say there was no end result there was no that was end agreed result. to. I think yeah. we need to be a little bit more focused on putting together <laughs> an alternative model, if that's what we decide to do, but we can't wait until October to decide that that's what yeah. we're going to do. Um, mm -hmm. If we want to do an alternative model and take control of this, because we only have limited options, we can ignore it and see what happens. We can do the preferred and drink the Kool-Aid, or we <laughs> or we can work together and put together an alternative model that meets all the issues and solves them. And it may not look exactly like what the legislature is telling us we have to do, okay? But, but we, we got to go put somebody in front of them. Really? We should do what works for us. Exactly. Right. And you know, yeah, that's, make those changes. That's what right we have up. to do. The alternative committee and get did it, really get it out there. Put together a very good alternative. And I, the 706B committee. You remember this legislation was written to drive the preferred model. The 706B committee basically had one task. That was either to accept the preferred model, either take it to the public or not. Not develop other models. We did that, that with the board direction. And, you know, there wasn't agreement on it, but there was a good alternative. There's definitely some good opportunities here. We don't have those constraints now. We can develop the models right. and move on. Yeah. And there's already a yeah. solid framework. And there's already a lot of <laughs> data collection that was done by that original committee that we need to include in what we do. So they did get a lot of work done. I, so yeah, it, and, and I, I don't discount that. They did a lot of work, but I, I just don't want to continue a lot of 
forum, I think everybody's really in agreement about local control and uh, not taking on the debt. Well, we need to work with the other towns. I, I just Craig, do you have a spasm in your arm? Or do yeah. you have <laughs> Hasn't anybody watched that map? Can't we get Montpelier to come in with this whole group? Mm -hmm. Make Montpelier the junior high, their high school, in their high school U32, go one to five in the schools, and do a, that, that, it's like a spoke and Montpelier is the center. Yep. And they won't budge. I mean, and it's so smart. They only got 200 students. Make your 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in Montpelier, do your high school up here, and get all the schools to 1 to 5. Yeah. Are they possibly waiting till you, till Washington Central resolve some of its stuff? Are they kind of on the outside waiting for some stuff to resolve? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this has been going on for 30 some years. They've had conversations so with dumb. other districts, too. <laughs> They wouldn't give up. They basically, would, they came to the meetings, to the consolidation meetings. They basically would not give up their local control. Under the original Act 46 proposals, they, it was, what was the cutoff? 1,200 in the original. And it politically got reduced to kind of boot Montpelier out of the mix. And that was politics. So they now don't have to do anything. So they're in a position of power. But you're right. You're absolutely right. That's the best way then you'll have all your junior highs in one spot. Your high school is in another spot, and all your yep. elementary schools feeding those two yep. areas. And they would all yeah. have their yep. own board, correct? Yep. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and then yeah. answer to a group. And have yeah. their own building. Yeah. You'll get yeah. one supervisor in the room. You're right. And children. what's nice is that the elementary schools would stay the same and based in their communities, which I mean, is exactly what people want. Right. Well, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of support for that. Yeah, upper I was level, right. We would have sure. two junior highs going to one high school. Yeah. You're right. And, and how there are the, people how in the school board work? Yeah, there are people who are one school well, for whole mass. Yeah. Montpelier likes its centralized model, one board for pre-K mm. high school. They like having one board for all of those schools. We obviously don't. So <laughs> <laughs> Well they they didn't say that at the, when they came and spoke <clears throat> at the U thirty two the oh. they said the reverse. They didn't want to give up local their board authority. Which would they would have to give up in a preferred model? That was they would not agree to that. They, so that was a deal. That was a deal killer. Interesting. Another way to talk to them. I want to ask you a, a couple questions of the board, uh, thinking about moving forward to the next meeting. Um, a, how is it going to be different than this meeting? Are we going to build on this? Um, B, is there a way to communicate what happened here in a consolidated form? And somebody asked about resources. You did, actually. What other resources are out there? How can we find more information to read on our own? Is there someone that can put some of that information out or websites on Front Porch Forum or somewhere? And D, how do we recruit more community members? So make it a yeah. challenge maybe that each of us <clears throat> tries to bring two neighbors or two other mm -hmm. friends in the community to reach out more. I know a lot of people, despite getting the mailing, it was completely off their radar this time of year with kids doing there's sports. A, yeah, there's a lot going on. Right. So we can kind of just word of mouth and talk about it more. Yeah. What's your sense, Dot, about the next meeting? Is it just another one? Like this, or it what? will be very different. <coughs> once, yeah, Chantel will be here, and I won't be. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, I thought no. we got we got you for that thing. Will there well, be pizzas? U thirty two is is meeting. That well, day. the other thing that will be different is we will know what actually happened in the legislature. Yes. Yeah, that's so right. we can so know. I don't think we have. Well, some of it. We won't know, we know. We 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 know the budget. We're doing. If you didn't sign the, the sign-in sheet, please do so. So the next meeting is uh, the thirty-first at six p.m. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We'll try to make it different, and we'll try to get more other people here. The um, kindergarten. Preschool, I know, kindergarten meeting pretty. is 5.30 to 6.30, yeah. so people might come in the middle or I'll try, yeah. I'll try and end it early so that they I knew have that, more time here, thought, but that's a good group of people that will come right from that to this. Yeah. 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 Something yeah. that we should really <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> your next meeting is here. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. He's bringing pizza. <laughs> one, one he's making pizza. pizza. <laughs> oh, he's making <laughs> pizza. He's not coming. Cow's pizza. Well, one thing that should be really considered is a collective meeting with select boards from the five towns. I highly recommend 
bringing everybody together and having this conversation. I don't know if we do it right now. We wait to, you know, we have a few meetings of our own, but and this is a conversation that really is going to it's going to have to be a cooperative effort among the towns. It's going to have to be a unified yeah. voice. They, they, let me tell you, they, we've been heavily involved with this since the beginning, and there, there is a steamroller on this legislation, you know, to push it through and not the preferred the preferred model. And you know, they've done it's shipped still. at it around the edges minimally, but you know, I think it's going to have to be a fairly widespread and unified voice for them. Because they, they have to know there's going to be a price to pay for this. Because ultimately, they answer to us in the polls, you know. They're, and this this is something that, you know, that's our only hope in reeling this in. I don't hear anybody here tonight who favors that preferred model. Yeah, Not I agree. Anyone? I didn't hear any of it in any of the very two people at the public meetings, you know, or wait at the. But you're right that we need to start talking more broadly, yeah. I think, yeah. to the other towns. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think um, also to still maintain an open mind towards the, yeah. the consolidated structure, just because or there features are... Of it. Or features of it. Right. Because there are, there are definitely important ideas yeah. to come out of that. Yeah. Well, I remember, you know, when Scott and I originally testified to the House, when this was being debated, you know, we said to them, you know, be careful, don't enable, don't mandate, enable towns to do this. Provide the expertise, provide provide the funding if it takes that. It's local boards, communities, There's a, this is complex to consolidate. Some places it works, but you can't, it won't work everywhere, and there's no one who knows better who, you know, how that's going to impact a community, who their partners are going to be than the people in those communities. And unfortunately, they went the exact opposite way. Mm -hmm. And they dictated it. They created a structure that's kind of uniform, and it will work in some of them. Unfortunately, usually the wealthier and larger towns, and a lot of the smaller towns are going to be victims. And it's been proven in the past in other states, and it's failed. I mean, it's seen it work in, in, in any state where those numbers don't pretty much match. And this is, you know, that was the mistake they made here. You know, they. It's a tops down instead of bottoms up model, and this is a pretty bottoms up state. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? <laughs> Thank you. I have a final thought. Um, the school was very generous in setting up this room this way. There are usually tables in here, and I just felt that it was yeah. more comfortable to talk <coughs> at each other rather than across tables. So if you could stack your chairs, and then it'll make it easier for them to reconfigure the room, I think. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming.